questions here live, so that's like ask questions, all good. So um, you guys matter too. <laughs> so, all right. Um, all right. So what we're going to be going over today is going to be the um, hypothalamus, pituitary axis, HPA axis, and it goes to adrenals as well, and all the hormones that come from the pituitary in particular. All right. So, um, yeah. So first, hypothalamus. That's in the brain. And that's a good thing to know. So hypothalamus. Thalamus. Not a spelling class. OK. Hypothalamus is going to be in charge of most of the time saying, when do we need to have hormones released? The, the pituitary is going to be like a backup. The hypothalamus will go ahead and release things that tell it to go ahead and release hormones. But the pituitary also has um, regulation so that if one gets a little messed up or a little bit off, it has a double check. Okay? So hypothalamus. And I'm going to go ahead and draw an overly large pituitary where we have an anterior and then a posterior portion. And then we have the stalk that is connected up to the brain, and that stalk has a name called the infundibulum. Which, for some reason, makes me think of the word supercalifragilisticexpialidocious, because it's like from the same family, clearly, the only two words <laughs> from that language. So we have anterior and posterior for the pituitary. Now, um, we have, we're going to go over the posterior first because there are only two hormones that are going to be sent through the posterior. And those ones, the posterior pituitary actually doesn't have any regulation inside of itself because it's more like a slide. The hypothalamus makes the hormones and it chooses when to release them and then it will send them down through the posterior pituitary. The posterior pituitary is just distributing. And so the regulation that, we're, that I mentioned earlier is for hormones in the front. There are two hormones in the back. Those are going to be arginine vasopressin. Arginine vasopressin. And I've come across it in, um, more often in this other name, where it's antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. Arginine vasopressin, AVP. And I've, but he, he prefers uh, AVP, but uh, I've seen um, antidiuretic hormone more often. Hormone. So ADH. And it's kind of nice to know both of these names, not only for the usual reasons of if you come across it, it's called something else. What is that? I have no idea. It is um, also because uh, this hormone has two ways in which it helps us to raise blood pressure. So if you have low blood pressure, then you can pass out. You don't get blood to the brain. That's a serious issue. So we have ways to raise blood pressure. We have the vasopressin is going to, that's referring to when blood vessels are constricted to raise blood pressure. And then antidiuretic hormone, um, that one diuretic is referring to when you urinate. This is to make so that you are recycling as much water from the kidneys as possible. This is the exact same molecule, just two different names, but the names derive from the two actions it does in order to raise blood pressure. Okay, so these guys, uh, all right, so arginine vasopressin would be made, I'm going to go ahead and change where I put this, it would be made in the hypothalamus, brand new, nice little star there that does not look anything like a star, there we go still doesn't look like a star. Perfect. And it would go down through the posterior pituitary and be dumped in the blood, and then it would go through the blood, reach the blood vessels and um, the kidneys, and act on both of those target tissues. Okay? So, the other uh, da, 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 hormone in the posterior, uh, from the hypothalamus through the posterior pituitary, is going to be oxytocin. 
Now, oxytocin has um, several functions. The two that he particularly touched on that he wants you guys to know, one of them is the suckling reflex. It's not the production of milk, but it is the um, efflux of milk, the uh, milk leaving the mammary gland. And so it gets squeezed out. Oxytocin helps those smooth muscles squeeze. And um, so we'll go ahead and put mammary glands. Mammary glands. And it also is with um, the uterus in contractions during birth. So that's going to stimulate contractions, but it also, as the contractions happen, they actually cause the release of more oxytocin, and so every contraction gets stronger because of the positive feedback loop. And with suckling, I uh, would not be surprised if there's also a positive feedback loop with that as well, but I'm not sure about that. But definitely with contractions in pregnancy, it's one of the few places, so there's more than one, but it's one of the few places in the body that we see a positive feedback loop, and that's why it's uh, one of those good things to ask questions about. So there you go, contractions and positive feedback. Okay, another cool one that uh, didn't get brought up in the PowerPoint, but another cool one with oxytocin is that it has to do with bonding. And um, a lot of people may, well, some people may have come across the bonding where you look into someone's eyes or actually you can look into a dog's eyes and they have a, an expression that is like enough to pick up emotion off of that you can have an oxytocin release and you feel bonded. This also um, has to do with mother-child relationship. Huge oxytocin release just happened um, from birth and that's one of the things that solidifies a really close uh, bond. Mm -hmm. Something that isn't, as talk, isn't talked about as, as much, but is fascinating, is that it's actually for positive bonds and negative bonds. It just strengthens bonds um, with a positive um, preference. So it has a preferential treatment towards forming positive bonds, but it can actually strengthen negative as well. So whatever you've got, if oxytocin is released, it will strengthen it in that direction. All right, so those are the two in the posterior pituitary. Now let's go into the five that are in the anterior pituitary. So for this, first we're going to talk about the releasing hormones. And these guys are coming from the hypothalamus, because the hypothalamus isn't going to make the anterior pituitary hormones. It only makes the posterior pituitary. In the anterior, it's actually just going to talk to cell bodies that are inside. So here's a cell body inside the anterior pituitary. And the hypothalamus is going to send through a portal system, blood, a blood system that is a it's a portal blood system. Portal meaning that uh, it's uh, recurring capillary beds. And so it comes down. Usually you would have it be artery on one side of a capillary bed and then vein on the other. This actually has capillary beds recurring. And so we call it a portal system. Um, All of the releasing hormones will be the same. Okay. Yes, so all the, all the uh, releasing hormones, I will mention something that's sort of an exception, it's not exactly a hormone at that point, but the hypothalamus does release one thing that isn't a hormone and is a little different, but for all the ones that are strictly hormones, and that one as well actually, it's going to go down this same pathway. So from the hypothalamus to the cell body of its choice, in the anterior pituitary. And there's going to be multiple cell bodies depending on the hormone that we're talking about. But the blood will pass by all of them, so whoever needs the particular message will receive it. Same pathway, just whoever grabs it out is different. Cool? Okay. So these releasing hormones are the hypothalamus saying, cell body, you've been making whatever your specialized hormone is, You've got it in the basket, go ahead and dump the basket out and into the whole bloodstream. 
and then it will go and act on whatever its target tissue is. So it's just saying, go ahead, dump what you've got into the bloodstream, carry it to the whole body. Okay, so releasing hormones are the hypothalamus's directive. Next, we're going to have, what are the names of all those cells, all those um, cell bodies? in the anterior pituitary, because they all have specific names, and then what the heck are the actual hormones released? Okay, so let's go ahead and jot up some of the releasing hormones. We're going to have... Uh, da, 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 da. CRH, corticotropin releasing hormone. We're going to have G, GHRH. We're going to have GNRH. Have the weird one over here, and then there's one other guy. Let's see, what do we got? Anybody happen to have the slides? Uh, Thank you, thyroid. T R H. All right, so corticotropin releasing hormone, C R H, growth hormone releasing hormone, G H R H, growth hormone releasing hormone. GN is for gonadotropin, GNRH, releasing hormone, gonadotropin, releasing hormone, and then thyroid releasing hormone, TRH. So RH always stands for releasing hormone, and I'll go ahead and write above it um, cortico growth gonad and thyroid. Thyro. All right. And then we have a weird one at the end. It's not really strictly a releasing hormone um, because it's actually, we'll talk about it later, but I'll go ahead and jot it right here for right now. I'm going to go ahead and write it in red. Dopamine. And he's going to be doing a slightly different job and he's not really in the same family, but he's released from the same place and he will arrive to talk to people in the anterior pituitary. Okay. Now, two of these guys, they're, these are all going to say release what you have in your basket. There are, for growth hormone releasing hormone and for gonadotropin releasing hormone, they actually have a buddy who can also be released called SRIF. So where GHRH and GNRH say, dump your basket out, these guys are when the hypothalamus is like, wait, no, don't dump your basket out. Keep it to yourself. With growth hormone, we usually are releasing a steady rate. Well, steady, it's not steady through the day, but it's a normal rate. It peaks at times and it troughs at times, but you're releasing some through the day. And so we actually are kind of on a medium level. And so it makes sense that we have a way to turn it up. And since we have a medium level, it's not nothing, we have a way to turn it down. And so same thing with gonadotropin releasing hormone. We have a way to turn it up, we have a way to turn it down. And actually, as I said that, I'm going to go ahead and move SRIF over to thyroid because gonadotropin releasing hormone is like, no. SRIF is underneath thyroid releasing hormone, excuse me. Scoot that over. So those two are the ones who are kind of at a medium rate, and you want to be able to turn it both up and down. All right. The other ones may not be completely off, but they aren't as important to have a way to shut them off or to at least lower them more. So these are the ones that can be released. Any questions? OK. Cell body names. So we're going to go ahead and have the cell body name for um, CRH is going to be corticotroph, 
and all of them have troph at the end, so I'm just going to write cortico. Next, we have somato. Somato, um, referring to body, and growth hormone is going to make so the whole body grows. And then we have gonad O for gonadotroph. And then we're going to have thyro for thyrotroph. And then over here, we're going to go ahead and have lacto for lactotroph. And I'll write out troph on this one just so we can remember troph is at the ending of all of them. All right. So these are the bodies. CRH would talk to corticotrophs. GHRH and SRIF can talk to somatotrophs. And so on. The hormones released by each of these now. Corticotrophs are going to release ACTH, which is adreno cortico, and so there's the corto coming back again. Adreno corticotropic release, uh, ACTH, adreno corticotropic hormone. <coughs> Okay. Okay. GHRH down to the somatotroph, that's going to cause growth hormone to be released, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> Gonadotrophs are unique. They have two things that are released from them when they're stimulated. One of them is follicle stimulating hormone. Follicle. And we'll talk about these stimulating hormone. And then also luteinizing. Luteinizing hormone. Both of these have to do with the reproductive tract, which is what gonads refer to. And so follicle, and they're named after, by the way, they're named after the female reproductive system. And so follicle stimulating hormone, you will find it in men, even though they don't have follicles. But um, follicle stimulating hormone, follicles are where it's going to go in the female, and so you know that from the name. So you already have the, the female target tissues memorized with this. Corpus luteum is for luteinizing hormone. And we'll write down the target tissues as we go on. Um, so yeah, gonadotrophs will release both of these guys. Thyrotroph is going to go ahead and release thyroid, thyroid stimulating hormone. And then lactotroph is going to go ahead and um, release prolactin. So thyroid stimulating hormone makes your thyroid work harder. We'll talk about each of the stories of these. Um, prolactin is, we talked about milk being, um, oxytocin helping milk be expressed out of the mammary glands. Prolactin is for the actual production of milk. Okay, so a lot of writing, a lot of words. Now let's see if we can make this make a little bit, oh, let's make this mean a little bit more. Negative, negative. The negatives that I'm putting next to it are just saying that they're inhibitors. And the last one that I stuck a negative on was dopamine. And that's because dopamine, let's talk about the dopamine, lactotroph, prolactin story first, all together. Because going through the whole chart keeps it all chunked up. And so I think it's better. Let's just go through one at a time. So. As it turns out, the lactotroph, which is going to eventually be able to make prolactin, and that makes so that you have milk available for your child, that is always turned on by default. And since we, and so I don't know why it's that way. I can't think of a reason why it's better that way. But since it's always on, and we don't always need milk, particularly if you're a guy, because guys do have mammary glands, um, we need something to turn it off. And so the hypothalamus is constantly releasing dopamine to turn off the lactotroph, and therefore no prolactin gets made. As soon as the dopamine goes away, the lactotroph will go ahead and make prolactin, and 
um, prolactin will go to the mammary glands to pr express, uh, help them uh, produce milk. Okay, so it goes through the bloodstream to produce milk. Mammary gland. Milk. Okay, so if um, by the way, if someone has a dopamine inhibiting medication, they can find themselves um, having milk expression, yeah, lactation. Mm -hmm. And that can happen to girls, can happen to guys. If you don't have dopamine, mammary glands will be turned on by prolactin. And so that's something that occasionally you'll see someone coming in and they'll be like, this started happening, I don't know why, and they're on a dopamine inhibitor. And so they're freaking out, it's okay, you know, assuming everything else is okay, at least the lactation isn't an issue if it's coming from a dopamine inhibitor. It's just inconvenient. So, next, thyroid. And for this one, so thyroid is kind of the butterfly organ that rests roughly around the area of your Adam's apple. And that is the regulator of our metabolism for all the cells in the body. It tells them work faster, work slower. Um, it makes so that if metabolism is higher, for instance, you'll chew up glucose down to energy faster, and then you'll use that energy for all the processes faster. Um, enzymes are sped up by the thyroid um, releasing what it does. So let's go further here. So when we want to increase our metabolism, the hypothalamus will release TRH, and it will go to the thyrotrophs. Thyrotrophs will then release thyroid stimulating hormone. Now, let's see what happens actually at the thyroid. Thyroid stimulating hormone will come through the blood, because all of these end up getting dumped into the blood to find their tissue. And at the thyroid, we have, I'm just going to draw a large thyroid cell. And this guy has a little receptor, and it's a thyroid stimulating hormone receptor, so TSH receptor. And it's waiting for TSH to come in and bind to it. And as soon as it does, it's going to go ahead and respond, saying, yes, TSH is here, therefore, let's open this transporter that has been waiting. Okay, two things happen with T when TSH comes. One of them is a transporter opens, and that transporter is called sodium iodine symporter. Sodium, N-A, iodine starts with I S, symporter, so N-I-S. And symporter, that tells us that both of these are moving in the same direction. Both of these are going to be coming in from the blood, and so you'll get iodine and sodium inside the cell. The other thing TSH turns on is a protein inside the cell called pendrin. I think we... And pendrin is going to go ahead and act on another protein called thyroid peroxidase, TPO. Now, before we go further, the thyroid has the job of making um, metabolism control hormones that we'll get to. It also um, is anatomically kind of interesting because it isn't solid cells. There's actually spaces in between a lot of the cells. Cells, And so if we have another cell over here, we have the space in between them. And there's not a space between every single cell, I don't think. Um, but there's a space sort of like this. Let's just draw this whole thing colored in right here. That's a space, and you can have a cell there, a cell there, a cell there, a cell there, all around this space. This is called a, the colloid space. And I'm going to go ahead and move our TPO so that it's inside the colloid space, because that's where I want it. Dang it. All right. So, and inside the colloid space, we always will have a protein known as thyroglobulin. Not very functional as it is. Thyroglobulin. 
So TSH is going to come in, stimulate the receptor. Receptor lets sodium and iodine come in, and it also turns on pendrin. So that got talked to, and that got talked to. Pendrin is going to go to TPO, and it's going to take the iodine as well. TPO's job is to put iodine on the thyroglobulin. Thyroglobulin can hold four iodines. And if you think of thyroglobulin as a toy car with no wheels, and then iodine as the wheels, you just put on four of them, and then this car thing, as soon as it's uh, got all four wheels, its name changes from thyroglobulin, which was a car without wheels, to, if it has four wheels, it would be called T4. If it's got three, it's called T3. Most of what is made in a healthy person is T4, which is going to be released into the blood. Any T3 that's made will also be released into the blood. And that is what goes to all the cells and tells them, hey, I'm here. You can go ahead and turn up your, metal your metabolism rate. Um, however, inside the cells, T4 actually is going to be drawn inside the cells, so will T3, but T4 is inactive for the most part. Okay, And so the cells can choose if they want to cut off one of the iodines and make it T3, where there's only three iodines left. And T3 is the active form. So the thyroid will spread it everywhere. The cells then will go ahead, grab T4, and then they can cut it at their own rate. If you release T3, then what if one cell, I mean, all of it would be active at once. As soon as it arrived, as long as it lasted, it would be active right then, rather than at the rate that the enzymes are cutting off an iodine that is inside the cell. This lets different cells have a different activation speed of the T4 to T3. And so instead of everybody getting the same amount of uh, active hormone, based on what's being produced, they can all specialize a little bit how fast they can activate the T4 into T3. So that was a lot of words. Um, I have another way of remembering this that's uh, kind of fun. So let's go ahead and do that for a sec. If you would like to, you can go ahead and imagine yourself on a green hill and there is a river running next to it, okay? Now, in the river, the very beginning is mundane. Just uh, remember, this one is uh, TSH. I didn't have anything special for it, but TSH comes in, and it bumps up onto the hill. And then after that, we're going to go ahead and have a wizard who picks it up. And this wizard is the Wizard of Nis, okay, N-I-S. And the wizard is going to go in and talk to a knight who is on top of the hill, and that knight is Arthur Pendragon, which stands, for, which is Pendrin. Okay, and so the things that Nis goes ahead and puts forward with the uh, TSH that he picked up as well, so sodium, iodine, and TSH, he hands him two balls in his right hand, and then the TSH in his left hand, and gives them to Pendrin. Pendrin is going to go and find a cannon, and that's the TPO, and he's going to go ahead and load the balls into the cannon, and then he's going to fire at over in the distance, over a giant lake, which is the colloid space, in front of the cannon, you can see a dragon flying in the air. And he's going to take four shots at the dragon with the balls that he was provided. And uh, each one will stick to the dragon. After it gets four balls on it, it will go ahead and crash onto another green hill. And after that, it will be rolled down. It'll roll down into a river and float away. So you have the Wizard of Nis, Pendrin. The, the uh, TPO, which is the cannon, and then the dragon, which is thyroglobulin, becoming T4, which will then come out of the colloid space, go into a thyrocyte or thyroid cell, and then that'll be rolled into the bloodstream, and that'll go off to the cells to do what it does. Okay, so that's at least how I like to remember it. And uh, yeah, so there you go. That's the thyroid story. Any questions on that whole thing? No? Okay. Awesome. Fairly well. Is the thyroid one also a medium set point? 
Uh, thyroid medium set point, yeah, it tends to be releasing a um, thyroid stimulating hormone. You tend to have some of it in the blood. And so is the growth hormone? Yep, thyroid and growth both tend to be um, released at a basal rate rather than all or nothing. And the rest of them, I'm, I don't, uh, the other ones, I'm not saying that they are nothing, but uh, these two especially have negative uh, inhibitors mm -hmm. to make sure that you can have a little bit more fine-tuned regulation. Okay. Good question. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So, um, for gonadotropin releasing hormone, so thyroid stimulating hormone, I'm just going to go ahead and write here, it ends up going to T3, T4. T3, I'm circling because it's the active hormone that is made in the cells. Uh, it'll be, T4 will be reduced to T3 in the cells. Fascinating thing, actually. If you have an iodine deficiency, um, a very slight one, then you don't have enough iodine to put four iodines on all of the thyroglobulin, so you end up only putting three, and so it goes out as active, and these people have an extremely high metabolic rate. Um, and often an iodine deficiency will start in an uh, elevated rate, and then it uh, will you'll run out of iodine the rest of the way and they'll rapidly crash and then they won't have any, their metabolism will go way down because their iodine runs out. So, okay, um, gonadotrophs next. All right, so gonadotropin releasing hormone talks to gonadotrophs, tells them to dump their basket. They have follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. Um, those ones would take a while to go into detail on and so I think I'm going to leave it at um, what I mentioned earlier. They go to the follicles or they go to the corpus luteum in females. In males, um, luteinizing goes to Leydig cells. And uh, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, goes to Sertoli. And the way I remember this is luteinizing and Leydig both start with L and it helps you keep it straight. So you're only getting it the, the, the male? I, I'm i just telling you the targets without going into the story. Oh, so okay. female is follicle and corpus luteum. Oh, okay. Male is Sertoli and Leydig. Thank you. Yeah, not at all. Okay. GHRH, the somatotrophs, releases growth hormone. This one has a little story. So that's gonna go through the blood to the liver. And then the liver is going to release insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor 1. Growth hormone is actually not super strong at making cells proliferate and divide and, and spread. Um, IGF, insulin-like growth factor, is the one that actually does most of that work. So growth hormone is just going to go to the liver and tell it, release the really strong growth hormone, which is actually IGF-1. Okay, and then for the corticotrophs, adrenocorticotropic releasing hormone is going to go to your adrenal gland. So your adrenal gland has various steroid hormones and mineralocorticoids and glucocorticoids are steroid hormones or excuse me are also from the adrenal glands and um, one of those that I'm going to go ahead and we'll write up a few there's uh, cortisol and then you can also get from there testosterone and estrogen family, because there's multiple types of estrogen. Okay, and ACTH especially, however, ACTH to adrenal gland is especially for cortisol, which is why it's up top. 
Okay. So with that, and actually testosterone and estrogen, I was talking about them because they're steroid hormones. Um, I don't know that I should have written them where I did, so just stick with cortisol for now. Okay. Um, with that, other details to throw in. The receptors that these guys use, uh, you guys talked about three different categories of hormone where you had uh, modified amino acid, you had steroid, and then you had polypeptide. So polypeptide means that it's a chain of, well, it's a polypeptide chain, so it's a sequence of amino acids. Modified amino acid means it's a single amino acid that's been tweaked a little bit. Steroid is the one that I wanted to talk just a bit about, and that's, this one is um, from cholesterol. And the steroid hormones are testosterone and estrogen and progesterone. Okay, cool thing about the estrogens. Three of them are esterone and then estradiol and then estriol. And I don't know about you guys, but I found it a little bit obnoxious that maybe I missed it and it was said, but it was never really pointed out that these are all in the estrogen family and it was like, oh, okay. I mean, it's in the name, but there's esterone, O-N-E, estradiol, two, so S there's one, two, and then estriol, three. There's estrogen one, estrogen two, and estrogen three. And as soon as, you, uh, at least for me, it helped me keep them separate and simplify what they were for. I think of it as like level of vitality. Esterone is going to be the most vital. You see it when, and this is like my little remembery thing. It's not strictly true that it's vitality. But I remember this is like uh, pregnant women tend to have high esterone, and it's like you have two life, you have two lives with you at the moment. It's the most vital. Estradiol tends to be a healthy young woman. And then estriol is highest in people after menopause, in women after menopause. And so that's how I try to remember those. Okay. Testosterone. So cholesterol, and I'll move progesterone up here because progesterone. Cholesterol will go to progesterone, and then progesterone will lead to all the other steroid hormones. Okay, so I mentioned receptors when I started talking about the different types of um, hormone structure. You can have ster steroid, modified amino acid, or polypeptide hormones. And which type of hormone you are dictates where your receptor is likely to be found. Steroids are hydrophobic. And so membranes, which are also hydrophobic, this is a membrane, these guys can go straight through membranes, and this is the nucleus, they can go straight through the nucleus. And so they will have their receptors often intranuclearly or intracellularly inside the cell, inside the nucleus. And so they can have a direct effect on the receptors that modify DNA expression and gene expression. The other guys can have their receptors on the outside because they're hydrophilic, and so they can't make it through the hydrophobic region of the membrane. There's one exception to this in the um, form of T3 and T4, which is a modified amino acid. And that is that the, uh, there's a transporter to bring inside, which we mentioned, T4 and T3. And then once they are inside, then they'll bind to the receptor that is on the inside of the cell membrane. This is because the cell, again, wants to regulate how quickly the receptors see it, and so the cell can be specific to its type on how much T3 and T4 is stimulated um, is stimulating those receptors versus the thyroid trying to say, this is on average how much everybody needs, and then it goes through the bloodstream and you'll turn on everybody the same amount. 
there would be other ways to regulate it, but this is one. Uh, this is one exception for intracellular receptor being seen outside of steroid hormones. So with that, um, and it's a tyrosine kinase receptor right here. Tyrosine kinase. Okay. Sorry, what is the tyrosine kinases for which, for what? It's for the T3, T4 receptors are tyrosine kinases. That's their family. And uh, that's kind of my uh, spiel and chart and kind of a word vomit today, but hopefully it was helpful. Mm -hmm. And any questions on any of this stuff? I just wanted to know with the cortisol, that's coming from the adrenal cortex. Adrenal cortex for cortisol sounds right. I need to review my adrenal gland. It's been a bit. Okay. Any other questions? So those are coming from those organs. The, the cortisol and the IGF. Yeah. So liver makes IGF one. Adrenal gland makes cortisol, and uh, thyroid makes T three T four. Can you repeat the women, like the female, um, for the growth for the gonadium? Sure. So corpus luteum for luteinizing hormone is the target tissue. And then follicle stimulating hormone goes to the follicles. Yeah, not at all. Okay. And then prolactin goes to the mammary gland, which makes milk. That one got written up. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Awesome. So, oh please. Oh my God. T three and T four is modified amino acid, but intracellular. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I will look. Okay. And um, the last thing that I'll mention is when you see all of the abbreviations A C T H and G H and G H R H, if there's an R in it. It's a releasing hormone. There aren't any R's in any of the other one. And so between the ones that the hypothalamus releases are always going to have R's, besides this weird dopamine thing. All right. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and cheers. <laughs>